It's time for us to begin our service today, and let's sing together our church theme song. We've come to bless your name, O Lord. We've come to bless your name.
praise the Lord. Praise His holy name. There is coming a day when no heartache shall come.
glory and the lifter of my head. You're my glory, Lord, and the lifter of my head. For Thy Father, again we are here in your house to commune, to meet with you, to listen as you speak, to sing our praise. Father, the praise comes from deep within our heart. It overwhelms us at times as it comes out in song and word. We ask that this will be a day filled with your presence that you would, by your Spirit, speak to us in such a great way. Father, I pray for many that are not well today, that you will touch them, be close to them where they are right now, and bring healing according to your promise. In Jesus' name we pray and ask these things. Amen. Before you're seated, Greet somebody with a handshake and a smile. I'm loving you more every day. Loving you more every day. Every 
जे आई एम लविंग यू मोर एवरी डे लविंग यू मोर एवरी डे in your hands and a couple of things to make note of uh, May 15th just three weeks the Harbingers Quartet will be in concert here at 10 o'clock it will probably be our last concert together for a while and uh, so mark your calendar and join us for that day you can see the other uh, concerts that are coming throughout the summertime and you'll enjoy those as well. The ushers <coughs> are coming to service as we receive God's tithes and our offerings of sacrifice and love. Let us pray. Father, we come again today with our obedience along with our love. You have been so faithful, so we bring our tithe and our offering, knowing that it will allow the gospel to be spread around the world. Bless the gift and giver in Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Pastor Keith Beecham is coming to minister the Word of God to us today. The Beechams have been pastoring a number of years here in the state of Minnesota, North Dakota, and uh, he's been a part of our congregation, sharing often with us, and we love his ministry so much. Would you welcome Pastor Beecham to our pulpit today? Good morning, everybody. Good to see everybody here today. I think our crowd is growing a little bit after the COVID and after the winter and whatever else. And we just praise God for that. I want to thank Pastor for the privilege and opportunity to share. Uh, once you're a preacher, always a preacher, I guess. <laughs> but um, I just uh, so appreciate these times. But actually, most of the time, I'd rather be sitting out there listening to him. Uh, that's what I like the most, yeah. Or him or some of the others, yeah. But um, when it comes to my turn, I'm happy to do it. And uh, glad to be here this morning and, and share. Um, one time a pastor got up and said, Before I preach, I want to say something. <laughs> so that, that's what I'm going to do here for just a moment this morning. Um, most of you know that have been around the church for a while and been around me and so on, uh, know that I love music. And um, that's part of the reason that, that we attend this church, and because of the music. And uh, I would just like to, once again, I know I've done it before, but I'd just like to again, once again, thank those that are part of music. First of all, I want to say thanks to Pastor and, and, and his wife Judy. Um, but the way they, they, they lead music and the selection they, that Pastor makes and Pastor Sherry and being our music pastor, um, uh, it's just so wonderful. It seems like it's always so well orchestrated and so, put, so well put together. And um, we want <coughs> excuse me, also, you know, thank our organist, you know, that, um, that she does such a wonderful wonderful job of Phyllis Holland and is there every Sunday morning just uh, just going with, with that you know um, you don't want to forget our other musician up here <coughs> that uh, Charlotte Thompson an accordion um, does, does, right, does a good job and is right there every morning as well and there's others that have special music and so on and I just uh, am so thrilled to be a part of all that after Easter Sunday morning service with the choir and all of those that took part, I told somebody, I, I just felt like just going right up to heaven right that day. Yeah, I just, that's the way I felt about it. And it was so, so thrilling. So uh, it's just a wonderful thing. <coughs> a number of years ago, um, well, I shouldn't say a number of years, down through the years, my wife and I, Janet, have every once in a while stopped and thought about our lives and talked about God's blessing on our lives. We both grew up in similar situations, both grew up on, with, with farmer kids, um, with a large family, um, not, you know, toward the end of the Great Depression. It was actually out of the Great Depression, but it was still, you know, uh, the effects of it were still being felt. Weren't, uh, wasn't a lot of money floating around, but um, uh, we had wonderful homes and a wonderful background in that way. And we got to thinking then how that the, we both got saved when we were fairly young. And then the Lord led, both led us to North Central uh, Bible School. And, uh, and we met there and got married. And, and God just, uh, it seemed like the blessing just kept flowing. The Lord blessed us uh, well, then as we went on to the pastors with, uh, six wonderful churches that we pastored and, uh, and well, I should back up a little bit and say that uh, uh, that the Lord blessed us with five children yes five children you know nowadays that's a big family you know back when we were young um, we came from families of nine and eight and so on but anyway the Lord's blessing 
Well, the Lord blessed us, as I say, with five children. Uh, there, were, there was a boy and four girls. So when I uh, found out that, you know, thinking about, well, I've got four girls here, and I got to thinking, I'm going to make plans for those four girls. Uh, you know, what their future and what there's going to be like. And so I plan, you know, that the first one would marry a banker. And, uh, and then that the second one would marry a movie star. And that the third one would marry a preacher. And that the fourth one would marry an undertaker. And somebody said, well, what, what's, what's, why would you uh, have them line up that way? Well, as the old saying goes, one for the money, two for the show, three to get ready, and four to go. I, I, I've had it made. I've had it made. Only thing is, it didn't all turn out that way. Yeah. The truth of, truth of that story is uh, I do, do have four daughters. Yes. Some years ago, when we were pastoring in North Dakota, um, our district superintendent came and spoke and uh, was our visiting speaker, uh, Reverend Lloyd Jorgensen. And uh, <clears throat> so he came and stayed overnight with us ahead of time before speaking on Sunday morning. And uh, we just had a wonderful visit with him. And, and he was such a, a person that was right, uh, as we say, right down to earth, you know. And so he, he was sharing about how he says, you know, I'm getting older. And uh, I didn't think of him as being old, but uh, he, he, he said, I'm almost to retirement. And he was. He was getting up there uh, close to that time. I don't know exactly how old. But he said, you know, I, it's so easy to get into a rut. And he said, I find myself doing that. So he said, you know what I'm doing? I'm starting to do just little things to try to get out of a rut. So he said, what I do is I notice that I'm putting on both stockings every morning first. And then I put on both shoes. So I said, what I've been doing is that I put on one stocking and then put the shoe on that, that, that foot too. And then I put on the other stocking and put that shoe on. He said, I just do it to try to break out of the rut. So uh, some years later, I thought about that and come up with a message along that line. So that's what I'm, uh, the main theme of my message today. I'd like to have you turn with me in your Bibles um, to the <clears throat> book of Mark, the 10th chapter. Mark chapter 10, we're going to start reading at verse 46. Mark 10, 46. Now they came to Jericho. This means Jesus and his disciples. They were walking along and they came to Jericho. And as he went out of Jericho with the disciples and a great multitude, Blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and to say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Then many warned him to be quiet, but he cried out the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. Then they called the blind man, saying to him, be of good cheer, rise, he is, he is calling you. And throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. So Jesus answered and said unto him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, Rabboni, that I may receive my sight. Then Jesus said to him, Go your way, your faith has made you whole, uh, made you well. And immediately he received his sight, and follow Jesus on the road. The story told of two frogs hopping along one day, and they came to a muddy road, across a road. It was muddy, and there were some deep ruts in that road. But they had to get across the other side, so they started hopping along, and sure enough, they both fell into a deep rut in that road. So they started trying to get out, and they tried, and they tried, and they tried, and finally the one made it. And he went on to try to encourage his, his friend, but the other one just couldn't make it. He said, I just can't make it. So the other one went hopping away. A couple of days later, the first one that got out saw the one that said, I can't make it, was hopping around out, out of that rut. 
And he said, how did you get out of that rut? I thought you said you couldn't make it. And he said, I couldn't until a big, I saw a big truck coming down the road. Sometimes we get in ruts in our lives, rather it's, rather it's having to do with the spiritual or rather it's just everyday things that have to do with our lives. And many times, ruts are, they're, they are detrimental sometimes to our physical health, sometimes to our spiritual health, sometimes to the very way of life that we should be living and aren't, or whatever. And so we, we need to recognize that sometimes we need to break out of these things and uh, uh, let ourselves go on with the things of God. So I'm going to share some things this morning that hopefully will help us to do that very thing. First of all, we need to <clears throat> excuse me, assume responsibility for each one of us for our own lives. We're living in a time, and there's a big segment of our population in our country, and probably in the rest of the world too, that are, are, are trying to blame someone else. They're trying to say, well, it's my environment, it's my background, it's, uh, it's circumstances, it's this, it's that. Remember back a number of years ago, probably, I don't know, I suppose, I suppose it's been 20 years now, that it was popular to wear a, a t-shirt saying, the devil made me do it. <laughs> yeah. And uh, um, so many times people are blaming something else in regard to where they're at because of their failures, because of the way they're living, and so on. And they're not taking responsibility themselves for where they're at, what they're doing, what they're missing out, how they're missing out on God's plan and God's program. <clears throat> sometimes people even blame the devil. And they blame, sometimes they even blame God. And what a tragic thing that is. It goes way back to the beginning of time. You read in the book of Genesis, when God confronted Adam and Eve, or Adam especially, about after they had partaken of the forbidden fruit. And, and then, you know, God came to them and confronted them, and Adam said, Eve made me do it. And then Eve said, oh, the serpent made me do it. Friends, we need, it's time that people, you and I as Christians and, and, the, and the world as well around about us, need to face up to the fact that each one of us are responsible for who we are and what we are. And we can become by some, something by the grace of God what God wants us to be. And we need to stop making excuses for if we're failing to be what God wants us to be, whether a Christian or not. We need to recognize that. <clears throat> Then we need, to, uh, we need to see that, just as, as, along with uh, blind Bartimaeus here, uh, he said when, it says, when he heard that Jesus was of Nazareth was near, he began to cry out. He didn't wait for somebody to, 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 uh, to take him by the hand and say, come on, uh, let, let, let's go to Jesus. He, he took the situation in his own hand. He cried out. He cried out to Jesus. He cried out. Jesus, son of David. He didn't know how far away it was. He was blind. But he heard that it was Jesus. And he did something about it. It's time that we do the same thing. Then we need to, secondly, we need to believe that we can change. Jesus asked him, what do you want? And he said, Lord, that I might receive my sight. That I can change. Sometimes people get in a rut and they think that that's it for life. They think that there's no hope for me. They think that this is it. I'm doomed. But it's not, that's not the truth, friends. There's a story that is told in, that is recorded for us in um, First Chronicles chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. In the verses prior to what we're going to read here, it's just simply given some of the genealogy of the different tribes of, of Israel. But right in the midst of this, this is what it says. Now Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. And his mother called his name Jabez, saying, because I bore him in pain. Jabez wasn't a popular name. In fact, in the original, for some reason, uh, his mother uh, 
uh, associated with the type of birth he had and what occurred afterward, evidently, to something that was negative and something that was down and something that would, you know, cause um, not only physical pain, but uh, uh, some commentaries have said it was not only physical pain, but also with sorrow. And his mother said, I, I bore him, you know, in pain and in sorrow. But the rest of the scripture goes on to say, and Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that you might bless me indeed and enlarge my territory, that your hand would be with me and that you would keep me from evil, that I may not, uh, that I may not cause pain. So God granted him what he requested. We don't know what might have been in Jabez's life, whether he was born with some physical deformity, whether there was something, uh, something that was wrong there that his mother would give him such a name as that, but it didn't make any difference to him. When he got of age, when he could take responsibility, he believed that he could change, and he did, and he cried out to God, oh, that, I, that you would bless me indeed, that you would have the touch of God in my life, so that, it would, uh, that I could go on and fulfill what God wants me to do and what God wants me to be. We find here that Bartimaeus knew a secret. He knew to ask what he really needed. It wasn't just a want. It wasn't just a whim. It's what he really needed. And these are the, the words that just always thrills me when I read this story. And the words of, of, of Jesus when, when the, he came to Jesus. Jesus said, what do you want me to do for you? That sent chills up my back. That Jesus, the Son of Almighty God, the one who died on the cross, the one who rose again, the one who had victory over everything in this life, he said, what do you want me to do for you? He zeroed in on blind Bartimaeus. Jesus is saying the same thing to every one of us today and anyone that will come to him. What do you want me to do for you? Now that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean, friends, that, that we look at God as some big, Jesus as some big Santa Claus up in the sky, that he's going to give us all, the, uh, all of our whims and all of our uh, things that we think we might want, health and wealth and whatever else all the time. But it does mean that when we have a desperate need, when we need a touch from God, if we cry out to him, if we ask him, he is faithful and just to do that very thing. He, his word, he is bound by his word to do that very thing. Because in John chapter 15, verse 17, excuse me, verse 7, it says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and you shall receive it. If you abide in me and my word abides in you, you shall ask what you will. That's a wonderful, powerful promise, my friend, that we can get a hold of. Well, ask what you really need. That's what blind Bartimaeus did. He didn't go into any other detail. He didn't say, oh, uh, I'm blind, so I, I, I need a house. I need this, I need that. He needed healing. He needed eyesight. And he asked Jesus, and he got it. What do you need? You need salvation? You need to be saved? You need to get right with God? Call out to God. If you need more as a Christian, more of the Holy Spirit to touch your life, if you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that experience or whatever it is, call out to the Lord. If you need healing for your body, don't be afraid to be specific about what you need. If you need a change in your temperament, ask the Lord for, that, for help. And he's the one that can do it. He's the one that will do it. So much of the time we zero in on the physical when God is trying to work out in the spiritual and the inner part of our life who we are and what we are and what we should be. We find also that blind Bar Bartimaeus had some, uh, um, some challenges to get to Jesus because when he started crying out to Jesus, there as, as Jesus was back, passing by, as we heard in the song, that then he charged him and says, Bartimaeus, be quiet. Don't bother the Savior. Don't bother him. If you want to get out of a rut, if you want to do what is right, 
Stop worrying about what other people may say. Now that doesn't mean that we run roughshod over what people think about us completely and that we do, you know, the crude things and so on and that. But if, uh, if we worry about what other people say all the time, we will probably never do what is right in our lives. I, I remember when I first uh, got saved, or, um, yeah, I was uh, 16 years old, a uh, sophomore in high school. Um, well, actually, it was after the end of my sophomore year. But it was actually before I got saved, but I knew that I wanted to get right with God. I, I knew it needed to take place and so on, so I started doing things that would help me out. And one time, we were in the, the boys' bathroom, and one of the fellows had one of these little peephole things, you know, that you could look into, and you see pictures of ladies that, you know, um, well, back then, they had one-piece bathing suits, you know, that covered them from here way down to here, you know. Now, that was, oh, you know, back then. Now, that wouldn't do anything. But, and he, you know, I knew what it was, and we were passing around to different, and I said, I, I'd rather not. And the one fellow that was going to hand it to me said, oh, yeah, Beecham's got religion now. Well, I didn't care if they said I had religion. I didn't care what they said. I accepted Jesus as my Savior, and I wanted to live for him. I wasn't worried about other people. I wasn't worried about if somebody uh, called me a holy roller or whatever. And Bartimaeus didn't worry about what the crowd was saying around him. Be quiet. Be quiet. He cried out to Jesus. If you need a change in your lifestyle, don't worry about people around you that say, oh, don't get too religious. Don't get too fanatical. Do it. Go to the Lord. Stop waiting for ideal circumstances. There was a great number of people that were crowded around Jesus. And probably Bartimaeus heard the crowd and the, the people talking and know, knew that there was a lot of people there. He could have said, oh, I, I better wait for a more convenient time. I better wait until it's easier to do. Stop waiting for a convenient time to change what needs to be changed in your life, Christian or non-Christian. Do it. Do it. We find the blind, blind Bartimaeus did something that was bold and, and dramatic. It says, so Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. Then they called the blind man, saying to him, Be of good cheer, rise, he is calling you. And throwing his garment aside, he arose and came to Jesus. Do something bold and dramatic to get out of the rut. You'll never get out of a rut without something bold and dramatic. That frog had to put some extra effort to get out of that rut. The story is told in Mark the fourth, uh, in the second chapter, around verse four and so on, of uh, four men that had a friend that were, that was, he, he, he was a cripple. He couldn't walk. He wasn't able to help himself at all. So these four friends of his, they somehow put him on a, I'll call it a stretcher, and they said, we're gonna get him to Jesus. And so they heard that he was in a certain place, in a certain house, and they took him there. And lo and behold, there was such a crowd in the house and around the house and at the doorway of the house, they couldn't get anywhere near him. They couldn't get the man to Jesus. So what did they do? But and historians tell us, and I guess even some pictures in the uh, places of old then, they would have stairways sometime going up the side of the house that they, people could go up to the rooftop. So these four men, they carried their friend up to the top of the roof, and they took and tore open the roof. Now, that, that just boggles my mind to think that they would tore open the roof. It wasn't their house. It was somebody else's house, but they tore open the roof large enough to drop this lame man down in front of Jesus so that he could get healed. They did something bold and something dramatic and drastic to get the job done. Friends, if there's something in your life that's hindering you, it doesn't make any what it is. If it's a lifestyle, 
if it's a habit, if it's if it's a uh, if it's entertainment and whatever, then take some kind of action to take care of it. I think of a man in the Old Testament that's one of my Old Testament heroes. You know, I don't have a lot of heroes, so to speak, but I think that this man is one of the greatest men that, that there are. We don't hear a lot about him, but his name is Caleb. When the children of Israel were going to, traveling, they were traveling from Egypt, and they were going to go into the promised land, and God was directing them. And they sent 12 spies to go into the promised land to see what it was like. And they ate 12, and Caleb was one of them that was chosen from one of the tribe to go there and buy out the land, along with Joshua and 10 others. They, after a while, they came back from spying out the land, and they said, 10 of them said, or they all said, yes, it's a land flowing with milk and honey. Yes, it's, it looks good. It looks wonderful. But the 10 of them said, oh, no, there are giants in the land. There's, there, we can't do it. We, it's, too, it's too hard. It's impossible. Caleb and Joshua said, yes, we can do it. Well, because of the murmuring and because of the disbelief of the ten and the rest of the tribe of Israel, God led them through the wilderness for another approximately 40, well, 40 years. Now, Caleb and Joshua had to do the same thing. And I can just hear, you know, some, if we had to do like Caleb and Joshua, Oh, it's not my fault I have to go through and walk through this sand and through these sand dunes and all this, all the storms and all this wind and all this storm. God, why, 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 why? That didn't happen to Caleb and Joshua. Didn't happen to Caleb. Then they went into the, finally went into the promised land after all those that were older died. Got out of the picture. Got out of the way. And then it tells us in Joshua, the chapter 14. There had come time that after they had, now the children of Israel had conquered part of the land, crossed over Jordan, and had overcome Jericho and some others, and they were beginning to possess the land. And now it was time to, to divide out the, the inheritance to the different people, the different tribes. And so it had come time for Caleb. Well, here's Caleb, and he said, if you read it there in that chapter, he said, I am now 85 years old. That's a good age. That's a good year. Yeah, I won't, I won't tell you why it's a good year. I'll just say it's a good year. <clears throat> he says, I'm 85 years old. And, I, you know, let me paraphrase a little bit. Give you the Beecham rendition. I'm 85 years old. I came back with a good report. I've had faith. I trudged through the wilderness for 40 years with the rest of you. And I, I kept, you know, kept alive and kept encouragement and all of that. And then I came, we came in the promised land. And I helped fight and I helped do and I helped conquer this land. It says, I deserve to have a nice, peaceful valley with lush grass. And take it easy. That's Beecham paraphrase. But the scripture says, what, is, what did Caleb say? He said, ah, give me this mountain. He said, I know that there's some Anakins living there. I know that there's probably some giants living there. But he said, give me this mountain. Yes. Do something bold and dramatic. There's some people in this audience here today that have been saying and are doing, they're claiming their mountains. They've been doing it for, for years. Give me this mountain. What do you want Jesus to do for you? What do you want to accomplish in your life? God always has something more for us to do and to be, regardless of what our age is. Now some people, you know, have said, and sometimes my kids say it to me, and, oh, you, you deserve to sit back and take it easy. Some people, other people have said that. And I said, no, I don't deserve it. I'm, I'm going to do it to some degree, but I don't necessarily deserve it. 
but sometimes just simply old age and just simply the aspect that our bodies wear out and all these kind of things, it's there, it's a reality. And so we have to slow down or we have to take it easy or whatever, but never to give up. If you're going to break out a rut, going to mount anything, do it now. And I love this part of it. And it says, and so Bartimaeus, and he came to Jesus. He came to Jesus. He didn't let the crowd stop him. He didn't let anything else hinder him. Now, I don't know how he knew just where Jesus was. He was blind. But somehow he got there. He got there. He came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, Go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed him in the road. Break out of the rut. Say, oh, I'm not in a rut. Well, look at your life. Be honest with God. See if there isn't something that's there that might be hindering you to fulfill the greatest thing that God wants you to do and be. Father, we thank you. We praise you for wonderful examples in your word that tell us that in Jesus Christ we can do all things. We can do all things through Christ who strengthen us. That we can become overcomers. That we are overcomers in the name of Jesus. We thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for blind Bartimaeus, that Jesus, you healed him supernaturally because he took a step toward you. And in so doing, you honored his faith. You honored his step that he made. We pray, dear Lord, this morning that you would help each one of us individually to see if there are things in our life that are hindering, hindering us from doing and being our best for our Lord and our God. Father, may by the Holy Spirit, maybe you convict us right now. Maybe you say, yes, Lord. We need to say, yes, Lord. I need to make a change. I'm going down the wrong path. I pray that you will touch people's hearts and lives by the power of your word and the touch of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. I turn it to Pastor. Amen, amen. It is no secret what God can do. What He's done for others He'll do for you with arms wide open he'll pardon you it is no secret what God can do Pastor Beecham said, what do you need? Where are you headed? Ask Jesus to meet your need. So often it seems that the enemy says, well, maybe, maybe God's busy today. And he's answered that prayer and that one for those folks, but I don't know if it's even worth bringing it up. What he's done for others, he'll do for you. If you've had answered a prayer in your life, let me see your hand. Yeah, look around. If you've had a miracle in your life, let me see your hands. It is no secret, church. 
He is still answering prayer today. And as we sing this song, I'm sorry I don't have the words here, but you probably don't need them. Would you just bow your head? You may close your eyes. Some of you want to lift your hands in respect to the God of the universe. But make this a prayer. It is no secret what God can do. What he's done for others, he'll do for you. With arms wide open, he'll pardon you. It is no secret what God can do. Lift your hands. We're going to sing it again. <clears throat> it is no secret what God can do. What He's done for others He'll do for me and you with arms wide open He'll pardon you It is no secret what God can do. So let me ask you, what's your need today? <clears throat> Jesus walked by blind Bartimaeus and he asked, what's your need today? How would you respond to that question? <clears throat> Jesus is not afar off. He said he would live inside. So he's close to you today. He's passing by. And you can lift your need to him. He will hear and answer. If it should be you don't have a particular need right this minute, Maybe you remember a few months ago, there was a young lady that stood in this pulpit wanting to go to a very troubled, war-torn portion of our world, a single girl in their 20s, desiring to share the message of the cross. It, it, uh, it took a hold of my heart because a, a single girl in her 20s, going to be a missionary to as war-torn an area as I could tell you about. I'm not allowed to tell you because she's in a very dangerous place. I got an email from her late this week and said, please pray. Uh, she has gathered some disease. It's not, not life-changing, but life-troubling. And uh, she needs a little more financial support, and she has to learn. The, if your need isn't great today, pray for her, will you? Uh, that God would touch her. She's one of our missionaries. We're supporting. Maybe you want to help support, and we'll add to our support. <laughs> but uh, what is your need today? As we sing it a couple times, just from your heart, would you lift, Father, I need strength, or I need healing, or I need a financial need, or I need wisdom and decision. Uh, I need help for those that are close to me and my family that I could minister to them and, and touch their bodies through your spirit. What's your need today? Again, I'll ask you to bow your head, lift your hands, but while we sing, if you have a need, maybe you want to just pray and ask God, let the rest of us sing a time or two and then you join us. 
But uh, what's your need today? Make it known. Will you? It is no secret what God can do. What he's done for others, he'll do for you. With arms wide open, he'll pardon you. It is no secret what God can do. It is no secret. What God can do, what he did for blind Bartimaeus, he can answer you. Hallelujah. What he's done for others, he'll do for you. With arms wide open, he'll pardon you. It is no secret what God can do. Sherry's going to pray, play that. Would you just worship the Lord? Would you just begin to let his praise come out of your heart? Just, just write out loud. Allow the Spirit of God to sweep over your heart. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Father, we love you. Hallelujah. We give you praise, Father. You've heard our petition. We give you praise. Glory, glory, glory to God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Stand with me. Sing it again as our benediction, will you? It is no secret what God can do, what He's done for. He'll do for you. God can do. Pastor Holland, just share a testimony with us, will you? Thank you. About a month ago, Phyllis and I were parked at a traffic light, and somebody came and hit my beautiful red Buick, and uh, hard enough, his airbags went off. And uh, they totaled my car. So I was down to just a red little pickup. And then dear brother Jerry Johnson had borrowed my pickup to put some new running boards on it. And he drove it from Roseville to my house. And the next day, I wanted to get a haircut. I've never liked long hair. If you do, man, that's, you know, that's okay. And so I keep my hair cut fairly short and I went to Great Clips. I pulled out of Great Clips, pushed the brake pedal on the pickup. I had no brakes. And so I was about a mile from home and I was pulling out of this parking lot and there was a divided, with a barrier, you know, a uh, curb between coming in and going out. I couldn't stop with nowhere to go. <laughs> I went up over that curb and I was heading out where cars were coming in. 
Look, God helped us. There was no car there. I had to go out in an intersection where there was a traffic light, and it was no cars coming there. I went across that two lane and got the truck to stop up against the curb. And so I promised the Lord that I would tell you of the saving grace of the Lord Jesus. And I'm here today, <laughs> one accident and, and no brakes, and I'm still alive. <laughs> if, you, if you need to be seated, you may, but that's all right, Nancy, sure. You guys pray and you support us as when we're out, out on our RV projects. And his testimony reminds me of what happened to us, not this last trip, but the trip before, when we were headed to Florida to work when, on the disasters that the storms had brought down there. And our truck and our trailer was the brakes. Um, they call it pairing when they're paired together and you hit the brakes on your vehicle and it automatically kind of uh, ignites the brakes on the trailer to stop also. Well, we were going through, we were about an hour away or two hours from our destination, and we were going through a busy four-lane um, area in a, town, in a little town, and there was a little incline, and wouldn't you know that the, there was lots of traffic, and wouldn't you know that the light turned red. And so Wes was trying to stop on the incline not realizing that the brake was not reacting correctly on it. And I just want you to know that all I remember, you know, outside of saying, Jesus, 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 is that we didn't hit anybody in front of us. We got to the intersection. People were taken off on, now on their green and not looking anyway. They didn't know we were out of control, and we were out of control. Two lanes coming this way, two lanes coming this way, and us coming down that way without the brake reacting correctly. I want you to know that nobody got hurt, nobody got hit, nobody did anything. That was truly a miracle of the Lord. It is no secret what God can do, what he's done for others, he'll do for you. With arms wide open, he'll pardon you. It is no secret what God can do. Pastor Beecham, thank you so much for sharing with us today. God bless you as you go rejoicing in his name.